Hello, you're listening to the Otaku Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined here with Chris. Yo. And we are from the otakuspirit.com website. You can go there for our news, reviews, and coverage of new and old anime, as well as our wonderful community at the forum link at the top, social media links that are on the right side, and a little review button that you can check all of our reviews that we've done in the past. There's a lot of them. And we're about to add a whole bunch more. Because... Got a whole bunch done. Spring is done. Spring 2016 <laughs> is done. And we are kicking off our first of our reviews. We're not going to go crazy like we did last time. It kind of We actually us. have everything split up, everybody. <laughs> we got in split so that we're, we won't accidentally just keep on going. Yeah, and we did like what two part last time, and they were like three hour <laughs> and a half each, and it was it was deadly. It was it was painful. Did you talk uh, about the editing. opening? The opening, yes, it was uh, Disorder by UOC uh, Taikoku, which is the opening for Big Order, which is one of the ones we'll talk about today. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we I think I broke them down to about eight to nine each episode. There'll be four total episodes unless something changes. Um, but yeah, look forward to it. Um, as we go week by week and knock out all these shows and hopefully give them their due. That was the whole idea of really kind of breaking it down to being more separated into parts of four, is that we get more time to kind of suss out these shows, give, give them proper reviews. Yeah. Not that we didn't do proper reviews before, it's just, you get a little more time. But yeah. Um, Everybody was probably just hurting by the time they were done with it, with listening to us for three and a half hours. I was by editing, yes. Because it usually <laughs> always takes twice, whatever recording time it is, it always takes about twice as long as that just to edit it. So it was painful. But this will be fun. I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, we're going to kick things off with a bang. With the one everybody's been waiting for to hear our opinions on The Lost Village. Or uh, Mayoiga? Mayoiga? Something like that. Something like that. Uh, this is streaming on Crunchyroll. It ran for 12 episodes. It was uh, written by uh, Mari Okada, right? Mari Okada. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who's done like Anohana. Yeah. Um, Toradora. I'm, I'm blanking. I'm sorry. Toradora. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Trigger Show. Kisniver. Trigger, yeah, they're doing Kisniver. And I think that's really, really one of the ones that things that kind of bug me most about the season having two shows done by her it's like how did you juggle two shows of just completely different styles so maybe that was part of the problem or the part of the good i don't know uh but yeah this was a this was a drama mystery show again that aired on crunchyroll or aired and then was streaming on crunchyroll uh it's essentially it essentially takes place where in in a modern time there is a group of how was it 29 people I thought it was 30, but... It could be 30. Yeah, the, n- not much of a difference. Just one person didn't count. Oh my gosh, how could I get that wrong? <laughs> uh, but anyways, they, are, they all kind of uh, want to escape society, and they all have kind of met through this uh, particular website and have gathered together on this bus, and they're going to find this kind of mysterious village that uh, there's, there's kind of a, a myth of this village existing and if they can get there, they'll be secluded from society and they can start their own society because they just don't want to be in the world that is right now. Um, so they all jump on this bus. They take this trip. They kind of get lost along the way. But eventually they arrive at this village. And then there's kind of this mystery about this village and what is surrounding it, what kind of mysteries might be involved in this particular village. Uh, it looks like people have been in it until recently, but then you realize there's nobody there. Uh, and there's also the problem that there's a lot of people here, and they all seem to have their own different opinion on how to handle things. Um, they all have their own personalities, and that kind of clashes. So that's kind of your setting. You have this group of people that are some definitely don't want to go back to the real world. Some of them are afraid of where they're at, and they want to leave. Uh, some people discovering that they can't really leave, and that kind of just is encompassing there. And I. I guess, do you want to really get into kind of the, the mystery element that's in there? I don't know if that's pushing a little bit too far. We get, we get, we're, essentially, there is some kind of being that is there, and it is terrifying to the people. They're, they're kind of seeing it on their own, and it's they're trying to figure out what this mysterious thing is. Some people have seen it and have kind of recognized it in some way. And I guess I can just leave it there. Yeah, just leave it there. It's psychological thriller. There is a psychological element involved in here. Yeah, um, when I came in, this is a show that definitely been up and down for me. Like, when I came into it, I kind of appreciated just for being, okay, here's this group of people. They're all misfits from society. They're all 
basically nut jobs. Uh, they all have their reason for being kind of, well, not all of them are nut jobs, but they're a pretty good portion of them. They all have issues. And it's, you know, evidently issues that probably, you know, has pushed them away from society. You have somebody who uh, has issues with their parents. You have somebody who screwed up at their job and they're, and was humiliated. You have uh, somebody who has a loss. I mean, these are people that are, or uh, there's a couple that want to be together, but they're not allowed to be together. And so uh, elope off into this, you know, mysterious village kind of thing. So they all have their reasons for leaving society. And so it's kind of evident when I came into it with, I came into it with a mindset of, okay, they're rejects from society. Obviously, they're all crazy. Most of them are crazy. So it, it didn't jar me too much that, you know, right when they arrived at the village, well, going up to the village, they were all acting a little bit crazy. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm accepting this because I know they're crazy. I mean, especially Love Pawn. Everybody points out Love Pawn because she's the one that screams Well, she's, she's the easiest to point at. Yeah, she's the they... easiest. She's, <laughs> well, her and uh, Volcana were like the most loudest people in this group. And it was and it was another one, but I don't have him on my list here. But Judgeness. He was, there was another guy that was just, he was just loud. And so it was easy for me to accept that these people were crazy. But I did also have the issue with like, okay, Love Pawn, give it a rest. Why is why is nobody pointing out the fact that she's saying execute every two seconds? And so, yeah, I did have issue with that because a lot of my frustration with the show came in the idea that they came to this village. They're trying to check it out. And I like that mystery of how are they going to pull things off? Obviously, they left society. How can these people that reject a society build a society? Because you're essentially trying to build. You have a bunch of people that have their own mindset of what this new society will be. But unfortunately, they didn't really get into that. They they didn't touch on how they can make a society. They didn't really touch on how can they make things work. It was really a here's 30 people just bashing at each other on what they think they should do. And a lot of them were more into the extreme of a negative side. And I didn't really feel the show had enough of a moral compass within it to make it balanced. Yeah, you had Mitsumi, uh, Mitsumuni, but... Mitsumuni was like one of the youngest in this group. His opinion didn't matter much. Yeah. You had just a group of people that were all kind of crazy. I kind of gave it to Kaharun and Dahara, who was like the, they were like the tour guide people bringing them in. I was kind of leaving it up to them to make that kind of moral compass, but they never really played too much off of it. Instead, the show really became how can we be so negative over here and try to take this one person down? Because it's like, uh, it's, it reminds me of something like, uh, Lord of the flies, but without the attempt to try to make it work, just immediately to the, let's try to kill each other thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it progressed that a little bit too quickly. It was only in, and I, and I, and I, and I was frustrated more by, by that because you had 20 or 30 people just, constantly bickering and it was like you could never really get established any kind of order to what they were trying to do so it just turned into panning to, uh, jumping to person to person to person to person and getting their crazy choice of what they should do or not to do or i don't care it wasn't until i'd say like four or five episodes in that they finally kind of just they started uh dividing them and they were doing their own thing over here. These, this group was doing their own thing over here. It was it was really at that point where I started actually enjoying the show, really enjoying the show, because it started getting into the characters, what they were struggling with, and it was a lot more comprehensible because you didn't have a group of 30 people screaming at each other. And I think when they finally started getting into really the mystery of the village and what they were going up against, that I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was a little bit intrigued by what they had... Uh, or what Mario Kata had planned for this story to go into. Granted, I don't think that it really got to an ending point that was, like, mind-blowing or anything like that. I think it just got to a point where it was like, okay, this is what they were going for. Conclude. I, I get, I'll, go with, I'll go with that. Nothing really groundbreaking, but at the same time, I kind of appreciated a few of the stories. I really like Masaki's story. I, I think that was probably the best part of the show was just getting really into what Masaki was because she was really a mystery coming into it. Um, getting into uh, Mitsume's background, a little bit meh. It was okay. Hayato was was pretty okay as well. And there was a couple other ones that I think that they had some pretty cool little 
this is why I'm here and this is what I this is what I was struggling with and that's why I'm here. Cuz that's really what it comes down to is really who are these characters, what they came from, what are they struggling with and can they get over it? It really is what it comes down to. My turn. Sure. So I I I'm I'm going to lay down the law on this one because I'm the one who dropped it, right? And you kind of did until you learned it was Mario Kata, and then you went, I like Mario Kata. I gotta watch this now. <laughs> Are you really gonna do that to me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna cut that out. I'll leave that there because people are gonna laugh at the fact that I said, Hey, Mario Kata, I gotta watch this now. More than the fact that you watched it because of Mario Kata. No, I, at the time when we, when we first talked about it, I, I think that uh, in the preview, I kind of point, pointed out that I was interested in it because of Mario Kata. But but that was more because we were talking about other things that she had done. Um, but I it never really kind of like became set in stone until I was hearing people talking about it. I had already given up on this show. I was absolutely sick of this show. I could not stand the personalities. They were all over the place and just annoying. I, I it set me off. That's, yeah, that's I a just, true, and that's a true struggle with it. And I agree with that is the idea that there really is nobody here to like. And right. I'm I'm one of the kind of people that I say, even though you can't even though you don't like any of the characters in the show, it doesn't mean that there's not something there for it to say. But I do agree. Not a really likable cast. <laughs> um, it was it, about halfway through. I had I had given up on this show. Andrew had said something about the next episode, and I was kind of intrigued by what he was saying. But the the idea that I was watching Kiznaiver, I want to say, and I was absolutely blown away by a particular episode in there. And I was like, how is it possible that this particular person can write two shows right next to each other? One I absolutely despise and one I absolutely love. There's got to be something that I'm missing here. And then I went back through her backlog. And one of the in particular ones that I I came across was Anohana, which I had the exact same issue. I could not stand most of the cast of Anohana. But at the end, I came away absolutely loving the show. And I was like, OK, maybe I just need to deal with these characters for a couple more episodes and then I'll see where this is all panning out. And it was so funny because at the same time, I seen a lot of people suddenly starting to hate on this show. At the same time, I'm starting to love this show. It blew me away. I could not figure it out. How am I, the person who dropped this show, suddenly becoming the person who's defending this show? Well, that was, that was the ups, and I, and it was about the same time that people were transitioning from believing this show was going to be so bad it's great to okay that's really what they're doing it's not that they're it's not that mari is writing that it's too bad it's too great or that not that it's they're writing if you don't understand that so bad it's great is the idea of something being so bonkers and stupid and violent that it becomes comedic i, right. I guess is the best way to put it, or entertaining because I, it I, is so I always, outlandish i always looked at it like the b b movies and right yeah. exactly exactly it is essentially as a b movie um and I think that when people finally decide, realized, oh, that she is not going for it yet. Like you said, a B-movie. She's actually got something to say here, and I don't like it. That was a time when you came into it. So it was that. <laughs> I think it was the fact that the, you didn't like the B-movie kind of feel that it could have been. And when it started establishing itself, that's when you maybe started liking it. Right. And 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 then they start – when they actually started exploring the characters and actually – like Andrew was saying at that at around that same point, that was when they started splitting the group up and actually separating these characters out. And then the 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 overwhelming, um, just explosive angst and and frustration at each other, it it started to tone down because you're not you don't have 10 people trying to talk over each other. And suddenly you're actually hearing things that are actually discussions that are actually happening and. And I, that, that's when I actually was able to start seeing where these characters were starting to shine and how they worked with each other. Yeah, I still think that there was probably about 20 too many characters, but, you know, I could deal with it. <laughs> yeah, technically, if you're going to build a society, you kind of need more than 10 yeah. <laughs> what, what can I say? <laughs> but no, it, it, it all all done. And I, I yeah, I agree with Andrew. It wasn't a mind blowing ending. But I do think that it explored these characters and, and it explored them well. And I do like a lot of the things that came out of it at the end. And I was actually pleasantly surprised at how how much I enjoyed it in the end. Yeah. 
Um, I, I, I liked the exploring of certain characters, like I mentioned before, Mitsumi, Mitsumuni, uh, Hayato, and Masaki, and uh, like the even driver. the bus driver. I like I like like exploring on him. I kind of also sort of. I'm not gonna say completely. I kind of got a little bit of understanding of Love Pawn, even though, and I like they toned down on her. <sighs> Love Pawn halfway through the show. Love Pawn was yeah, and, and and she was the one that I I I. It's when you realize she is. It's a verbal tick. It's not that she wants to kill everybody. It's just that that's like her mental tick, not a yeah. verbal tick. It's really a mental tick. I I I came away at the end of the episode because I still I I don't think that her really truly wanting to execute anybody is truly warranted. I think that's no. still an exaggeration of She's her. She's just mentally screwed but, up. <laughs> yeah, I I did like her story in the end. I thought it was probably uh, the third best story out of all of them. <laughs> So, but that also comes into play. Of it. It's like it's sad that there's quite a few of them that didn't really even get touched. On oh, their story. I wish Nanko had gotten Lion touched. didn't really get anything. Uh, anything. I like that they finally got into Mai Mai. I actually kind of like Mai Mai. She was like best girl of the show. Um, but yeah, like Nyanta, uh, there's a lot of characters that didn't really not, didn't really even get touched, and some characters got touched, but they never really they didn't do enough with it that it felt like it was, you know enjoyable it wasn't it wasn't didn't feel fulfilling i guess is the best way to put it Mm -hmm. um but i still think it's it has some really good moments in there of character study and diving into them and trying to figure out what what they're hung up on and what could they possibly do i mean that stuff is was really the saving grace of the show itself even though it didn't quite go the direction that many people didn't think it was going to go um yeah it's it was it was still a good show i, I, I did learn something after after watching this show all the way through i have to be patient with mario kata <laughs> 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 i have to be very patient with mario kata and i i i do find that i i enjoy a lot of her stuff i yeah, but long, long the sea really love that one yeah She's she is a very very distinct. Lawlessy is another example. I could not stand Hikari at the beginning of the show. Towards the end of it, I I understood him and I I ended up finishing that show loving the show. So. No, that was one of the funny things at the beginning of the show. I was like, I I seen him as a kid, so I I mean I understood. <laughs> okay, he's a bratty kid. I don't like what he's doing. He's a, he's definitely one of those kids you slap on the back of the head and say knock it off, Just knock it off. <laughs> but <laughs> he definitely needed that. It's not going to change when he's alone with his friend. That's how he's going to act. So, um, I guess to kind of go back to what we did before one time before. I don't know if we've ever did it again since then, but uh, some suggestions if you if you like Lost Village or you were watching Lost Village and you gave up on it for whatever reason, uh, some possible choices for you. Did you ever watch Shiki? I started it. I, I started it, too. I but think I, I got I about finished. seven or eight episodes. You would not end. watch it now, I don't think. <laughs> uh, but it's dark, from what I remember, and has a kind of same feel to it, so you can check that out if you like. Uh, Higurashi, When They Cry, if you're looking for more crazy, psychotic, bloodlust, slaughter, and darkness, Higurashi definitely has that area. It's in a secluded kind of village area, and a lot of mystery involved with whatever's going on. Um, and another, I think another is... A show that just knocks at, knocks it out of the park in delivering a very suspenseful mi- mystery kind of show. So, and I'll eventually get Chris to watch that one. So, soon. Yeah, I'll review it. It needs to be done. Um, but yeah, that is uh, that is the lost order or the lost order, the lost village. I was looking at the next one, <laughs> the lost village or Ma- uh, Mayoiga, um, which is yeah, good show. Uh, moving on, let's go on to Big Order. Big Order. Order. <laughs> Uh, the Japanese title is Big Order. It's streamed on Crunchyroll, ran for only 10 episodes, um, and is an action superpower shonen. And th- Big Order pretty much opens up in a world that is kind of destroyed. Some kind of cataclysm happened. Uh, you end up finding out this this kind of being that they call Daisy was going around and granting people one wish. And whatever wish they want, whatever they asked and wished for would kind of happen, and they would kind of. They'd become what they call an order, and an order is this person that can uh, essentially use a certain kind of ability based off of whatever they wish for. And starting off, uh, you find out that some person has wished – why the world is so screwed up is because at some point somebody had wished to this being uh, to conquer it basically, and it causes big catastrophe. And you open up meeting Eiji, who he is the one that has actually – you know, wished for this, and it seemed like he maybe didn't want it to happen or whatever, but 
he's trying to keep it a secret from his sister, and his sister is, like, on her deathbed. And it seems like society doesn't know that Eji was the one that did this. Um, but quickly, <laughs> very quickly, uh, he is kind of sussed out by this certain group of people who immediately uh, broadcast the entire world that, yes, indeed, Eji is this one that, you know, causes catastrophe and caused so many people to die. He is your enemy, basically. And after doing this, this group of people pretty much bring him in and say, look, we're going to help you get your sister better, but in return, you're going to help us conquer the world. We're going to basically make your wish come true. We are going to put you at the front of this group of people, and we're going to go out there and we're going to conquer the world and use your ability, which Eiji has the ability called order, which essentially whatever he orders to happen it kind of is manipulated so no i think his power is domain or something yeah i guess it would be everybody has order it, well it, it's everybody just, goes order oh, yeah but <laughs> it, essentially it's like whatever he is within his domain yeah he can grant he can yeah he basically gains a domain of a location and he's able to tell things in that domain what to do All right so he can tell somebody to miss or tell somebody to uh, be my loyal servant or whatever. Absolute and have to domination do yeah. or something. Yeah, like I that. think that's what it is. Um, but yeah, it, with this ability and with this group of people, they all have orders as well. They have like a, a guy that I can't really say what his is because that's technically something they don't really reveal until later. Uh, one girl, she's able to tell the future. So she, she gets these little cards and those cards will tell her what to do in order to avoid a disaster or whatever like that. Uh, one girl can uh, recover. And so like e each person has these different things. One can bring peace about a battlefield and it kind of stops, you know, weaponry and whatnot. Um, and so using these ability, they kind of go out and they're, they're trying to conquer the world. But of course they're going to run into other people that have these order abilities and that are going to go up against them. Um, but yeah, only being 10 episodes, it's really hard to kind of give a full kind of perspective of what's going on because it kind of gets really into the big crux of things really quickly. Um, I say, I, I think <laughs> I'm really so back and forth on the show. This is like in cross age territory because while I liked this show for the world that it kind of developed, the the interesting mechanics they put into play, the abilities were interesting, uh, the combinations were interesting. At the same time, it was so chaotic in a good and bad way. It was it was chaotic and interesting and entertaining, but at the same time. When the episode ends, I'm going, I really have no clue what the hell's going on. Like, I understand what's going on, but I have no clue what's going on. And it, there's, you, it's like I never got a footing as to what was going on. I never got a foundation to build off of. And so I was basically confused most of the time trying to gather, why is this person care to do this? What's this person's motivation? Barely anybody had any motivations developed for their character. It was just, I'm with this group, so I'm going to just do this. And I think that's where I kind of struggle with it. But at the same time, I kind of liked a little bit of that chaos, the the quirkiness to the world. Like the, I know a lot of people had this issue with one of the characters in like the third episode where essentially AG touched something and something really weird happened. And it blew me away because I'm like, I can't believe they just did that. But they just did that. And that was kind of fun and entertaining in the way that it was just so weird but at the same time in the end when the show kind of concludes it's like i don't know if i really even got anything from well, that it, it, and i i guess i was entertained i when it comes down to it the this show i i i will i i'll flat out say i was entertained by this show I, there there's no way of getting around this i was entertained by this show i don't think that it it tried to do anything weird or or not weird it, it is weird it's the weird. definition <laughs> of weird but it didn't I think try if to you look up weird in the <laughs> it's probably got a it's, picture of that picture um but i don't think it was trying to do anything high-minded i don't think it was trying to do anything you know low row it was just it it was what it was it was an entertaining show now at the end of the at the end of this, I, I think I looked over at, at Andrew and I said, I wonder how far back this went to and and became a anime original, because I cannot believe for one second. And, and maybe somebody can point it out and say yes or no. Um, I don't need an explanation or a spoiler of what actually happened. But I, I suspect that the ending of this was anime original. Somewhere in, I don't know, halfway through the last episode, halfway through the second to the last episode, I, I have a hard time believing that this 
and I do feel that it was a fine chapter end. Um, it definitely left itself open and saying, hey, we can continue on if you want to go to the manga. Um, but I don't, I don't, I have a kind of weird feeling about the ending that it just didn't settle right. I don't think that it was a true ending per se. Does that make yeah, sense? I, I, my, my response was really, yeah, but I can see them totally doing, I can see them harken back to this certain point of the last episode and going, yeah, by the way twist and it would continue on i mean i can easily see a twist making the the conclusion continue on it, it's it's really a simple not as simple it's just a i can see this happening kind of thing but i can yeah i could definitely agree with you in the idea that i think it might have just kind of rushed to that point but i could easily see that being a point where a chapter in and then oh yeah by the way this isn't what you think kind of thing I don't right know. but any show can do that uh so that's not really something to say um I can admit to people that if you have issues with CISCON act, um, aspects, if you have issue with, uh, there's a lot of uh, censored, very promiscuous scenes that are involved with the series and didn't bother me so much. And that goes back to my whole mentality of... Just say they got naughty. Like, uh, they got naughty a couple times. Like uh, <laughs> Swartz and Markin, where it's like, Technically, this world is kind of screwed up, and would they really care about what you think is really kind of, you should do this or not do this? I mean, it's in a world that kind of is in chaos, who kind of cares kind of thing. So it kind of fits the narrative, but I do know that some people might be offended by that kind of stuff, and it is kind of there. Uh, so lots of white center bars, and I'm pretty sure the if they do ever release the full version, you'll, you'll get all that nutty bits. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that really is where it comes down to. I, I think they did a, a lot of really fascinating things with the characters. A lot of the battles were really kind of making up things as you go along kind of uh, rule sets, but it didn't bother me as much as I thought it was going to bother me. Uh, a lot of the conclusion of the story was kind of something I kind of seen in the very beginning. <laughs> it's one of those things where I can totally see this, and it's like, oh yeah, they really did kind of do that. They're, they're a bit of a stretch, but at the same time, it is not a very... You kind of see it coming from pretty far away. Not that it ruins it or anything, but I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm in the cross range territory. I, 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 there's things about the show with chaos that I like, and there's things about the show with the chaos that I really didn't like. So I don't know. We both agree it was entertaining. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was entertaining, but uh, I do know that some people will take an issue with the chaos. So that's really my own point in that. Um, yeah, uh, again, you'll pretty much know whether you like it within the first episode I would, or two. I would, say, I would say probably give it two episodes or so. It, it gets really dark at the beginning and it kind of has some dark moments towards the later parts as well. So also be aware of that, like executions and stuff like that. It does get really kind of dark. So Yeah, that was kind of rough. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> Um, but yeah, suggestions, uh, if you are in the realm of liking a show like this where, you know, you have a main character who's essentially is the enemy of the entire world, uh, there's shows like Code Geass that would be pretty appealing to you, Death Note, uh, Ajin, um, if you like the area of darkness and also violence as well with Ajin and Code Geass, they have those as well. Uh, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more light, but also has more political intrigue, there's Terror and Resonance that you can go with as well with the enemy against the world. A lot of people who pointed out that this is the same author and artist and all that of uh, uh, Future Diaries. and Yeah, I would definitely, I I, would definitely suggest that. I, I I think a lot of the characters, and there's some certain writing that does give me some nostalgia of Future yeah. Diaries. I wouldn't I wouldn't deny that. I don't think Ren turned out to be as much of a eunuch as I thought she no. would. <laughs> <laughs> like, within the first episodes, I'm like, that's you know right there. No, the there was a there was kind of a couple of characters who kind of leaned towards the eunuch side, but, you know, it was kind of... She just never showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Big Order. Or, in Japan, Big Order. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> my first my, my is, I don't know. Uh, moving on, we have Kagewane. Kagewane Season 2, or Kagewane Show, as the Japanese title is. Uh, it streamed on Crunchyroll, ran for 13 episodes. It was a seven-minute short, I believe. Yes. I yeah, about seven minutes. At least the second season. Yes, this the is the second season. No, the first season was too. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you don't know what Kagewani is, essentially Kagewani is basically, it is, it's a modern setting, but it's kind of one of those ones where, you know, all those little tales of 
you know, the Sasquatch or stuff like that is actually kind of real in this world, unless you believe there's a Sasquatch out there, and I apologize, it actually is real. (laughs) And there's this guy, in the entire first season, we pretty much had, like, different little stories of people running into these kind of weird monsters, and there was this guy named Bamba, who was kind of going around trying to track these down and try to figure out these mysteries, and he always had this kind of gash on his head that you kind of was mysterious about, uh, you know, you were thinking it might be he got a scar that he got from maybe one of these monsters. Who knows? Um, but he's always had this involvement with this guy that was this guy named uh, Kimura, and he was kind of a he was kind of a partner with him in the in the, in the past, or I was one of his 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 I... underlings because he calls him sensei all the time. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming that he was like his kohai or something. I don't know. I thought it was probably just a rival, and Banba just so happens to be a a sensei of some sort. Okay. With this season, it kind of brings Kimura more into the front line. You kind of have this back and forth be- between Banba and, K- of course, it was in the first season as well. Uh, Banba and Kimura, you know, Banba's tr- or Kimura is trying to utilize these uh, these particular Kagewane or these little beasts into, or not really Kagewane, but the beasts themselves into something usable in science or in power. And you also are introduced to Yagura, Yaguru, who is kind of this person that's from some kind of old tribe who's trying to kill these uh, these these particular beasts. And so that kind of get, becomes the focus. And instead of where – I kind of mentioned this in the first impressions. Instead of like in the first season, which I really loved, I thought it was a gem, you had these little short stories about different monsters that, there's, that these people were running into and these short stories about people that are involved with them. In this season, you're really getting a, a – a, full through storyline where you're really getting into Banba fighting against Kimura and this other agency and Yaguru who is trying to kill the, the the monsters and their kind of struggle between each of their own mindsets of what they should do going forward. One having a belief that they should all die, one having a belief that they should inherit that power that it's a it's a it's a step in evolution or whatever. And that's really what the storyline becomes. And I think this this particular season still had a lot of that suspense moments where because the first season had a great feeling of suspense like they have these moments where the music kind of kicks up and there's some monster that's getting really close and it has that that suspense that you just never really see in anime they were doing that here and there with the second season but unfortunately for me i didn't like the second season just because it became so focused on this organization trying to utilize these monsters and Bamba trying to fight up against them and Yaguru trying to fight up against them. That became, I mean, there was a story here or there sprinkled in like with Dr. Kai and uh, Satoru. I like their little, their little small stories that they had kind of sprinkled in there. But for the most part, it was this long narrative story that I don't think it really had much going for it. And in the end, it was like one of those, this is like a Resident Evil 6 movie or something like that. It, I just don't I'm, – I'm not really invested at all with what's going on. So not a bad season, but at the same time, I was disappointed because I wanted more of the first season, which I got, like I said, one or two stories in there that were like that. But for the most part, it was this one narrative that I didn't care for. Yeah, the, the this season was definitely the, the, the more frustrating of the two seasons. It's not like the most frustrating season because – it's only one, two seasons. Um, but I, I don't want to, to negate the show because it, it is a great show. Even the second season, I enjoyed myself watching it. I am frustrated in the fact that I don't think it was its stronger season because of the fact that like Andrew was saying, the narrative was changed in, and it became a long running story instead of where it was strong in the first season of these single compact stories and 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 just having uh, Bonba and, and Kimura popping up and doing some kind of a side information on it was just fine the way that they were doing it. This this season was more focused on that story. And I I don't hate it because, like I said, I, I enjoyed it. I, I liked the story even up to the very end. I was like. The story was interesting. It kept me engaged and. I was interested in seeing what was going on, but at the same time, I don't think it was as strong. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I also want to kind of point out that I like Kimura's voice. I think he was like an excellent voice for that character. Like 
it's not often that usually we point out like I loved Yume's voice from Grimgar and I loved uh, Rie uh, Kojimia. I liked Yato, but yeah, like I said, I, rarely ever male characters. Even though, like I said, I just said Yato. But I think Kimura was like the most perfect. The voice for him was just perfect. So I just want to point that out. Bomba Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> Um, suggestions. I don't really have any suggestions because this, you don't really run into many suspense thriller shows in anime besides Yamushibai. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Um, stories. If you like stories that are kind of more in the realm of spirit supernatural kind of stuff, there's a, there's a ton of yokai type stories out there. Um, really love the Mushishi series. Definitely check that out. Uh, Natsumi's Book of Friends, great series as well. But again, both. Both of those are kind of not in the realm of dark. Even though Mashiji does kind of get dark here and there, they're both kind of more upbeat kind of shows. So check this out. I, I, I wanted to add in uh, Death Parade. I think that one would be a, a good... It it had those tension moments, and it also kind of leaned more towards the emotional ideas, but it had this kind of... Um, how do I put it? Um, maybe it's a bad example. Yeah, I'm not following you. <laughs> I, I thought it, 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 it had those good encapsulated stories, but then it, 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 towards the end it revealed everything, and that kind of did the exact same thing. As <laughs> but yeah, it had the encapsulated stories, and it had the, those tension moments that were really kind of good, and it delved into the emotional. So I don't know. Bad, maybe it is a bad bad suggestion. No. Any chance to, to suggest Death Parade is a kind of <laughs> suggestion. So. Um, moving on, we go to 100. This is our uh, light novel adaptation of a kid in a magical school piece of crap show of the season. Yeah. so it's It's been done a million times. It's garbage. Move on. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on. Um, but no, this is uh, 100 had streamed on Crunchyroll. It ran for 12 episodes. Um, it is an action, etchy, harem, romance, school sci-fi show. Um, it, it takes place on an island called Little Garden, and or not really an island. It's a, it's a big ship, and this big ship is like a university. And on this little garden, uh, Hayato has joined this this particular school. And the academy essentially is a an academy that trains people to use these weapons that are called 100. And these hundreds are weapons that these people then can use to fight this kind of alien invasion that's happening that, of these aliens called Savage. And the Savage will, you know, come down to Earth on as, like, meteors, and they will dispatch these people with hundreds to fight them off. And uh, Hayato is kind of a special case in the idea that he is somebody who has kind of been infected by the blood that is that comes from these Savages, and... This infection can harm, can you know, cause harm to you. But if you're, if there's like special cases where you can kind of get over it, and he has not this this infection has not you know killed him. So uh, he his potentials in using a hundred is kind of really high, and so that's why he's kind of brought into this uh, this little garden, even though he has never even wielded a hundred before. And so when he arrives there, he gets his hundred. He goes through the opening ceremonies. Um, and quickly you're kind of introduced to a lot of characters that are within this academy on the little garden, like Claire, who is the student council president, who quickly kind of clashes heads with Hayato, challenges him to a duel early on in order to kind of, uh, prove her stance as the student council president in, you know, exacting order against those that are kind of not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the school. And following this whole battle, you're kind of, again, you're, you're meeting each one of the characters, you're meeting Emil, who, uh, has known Hayato from early childhood. You're meeting uh, his sister, Karen, who is also kind of ill and is always in a hospital. Um, and that kind of moves on. You meet, like, Sakura, who is this girl who is very, really popular. She's an idol. Uh, and you're just kind of going with him as he's learning how to use his 100 and fighting against these savages. Uh, and it's kind of like... Um, what was a show that I was thinking about? Was it World Break? The one where they kind of there. It's a school, but also there is kind of this 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 certain club within the school that if you're really good while you're doing your schooling, you're also helping the locals fight off the savages. And Hayato's quickly brought into that because Claire kind of sees Hayato's ability, and Claire, of course, is running this this particular group. And so they're kind of going off, and he's able to join in the fight even though he's within the school. So 
It's a harem show. What do you expect? It, Andrew's got strengths, fun harem moments. Moments? You don't know what a moment is. I don't know what a moment is. Apparently, my browser doesn't know what a moment is either because it has it <laughs> underlined. Um, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate the show for the fact that, and it was it was very weak later on, but early on, I really like the fun harem elements of the show. It, it, it had a fun old school harem feel to it. You had the the characters that were all kind of fighting over one guy. And yeah, some people might find that stuff is tropish and you might hate it, but I felt it was kind of refreshing and was fun. Um, it also does, it does well with dealing with new takes on how to deal with situations that are normally in a, a harem feeling like having Hayato alone with Sakura and Sakura kind of teasing him, but him kind of return that tease. That kind of stuff is really, really fun and kind of refreshing to have to the mix. But not only that, but I found like, I mean, really early on when you first start watching a show and you get established that there's this meal person that known, has known Hayato for a long time, you're you're kind of, you have those preconceived notions going into it, but I found, like, the show delved more into characters I wasn't expecting. I, he, They delved more into Claire than I thought they, they were going to deal with. Um, they delved more into Sakura that I, than I thought they were going to delve into. And so I felt it refreshing in the idea that even though it kind of opens up as a typical, typical harem setting, it really quickly exceeds expectations by jumping into characters you're not really expecting it to jump into and putting more focus into those characters than you would expect. Um, the downside of that being the idea that it does kind of a, uh, I guess I would spoil that show. <laughs> it does a thing where it kind of jumps back and says, oh, by the way, we're going we're gonna to go with this, this pick. And that's kind of a little disappointing, but I enjoyed it for that element. I thought, I thought him with uh, Hayato and Sakura's, thing together i thought that was really sweet i enjoyed that i really enjoyed the moments with hayato and uh claire as well i thought they were a really great team and the show really had a lot of fun with them together kind of thing um but yeah i I, but unfortunately in the end even beyond that it's just just it started kind of it was this is one of the shows that while i enjoy it to begin with it was one of those shows that over time it kind of lost its flavor and kind of dwindled down it had some really good moments towards the end but it's still in the end it is still a here's a magical school and they're fighting against monsters with weapons they're training with and that's where it kind of gets left at and it becomes one of those things where i can't really suggest it because i know in Two weeks, I'm gonna forget about the show. Unfortunately, it's one of those un- it's one of those forgettable shows that I'm just I know I'm not gonna ever think about it ever again in the future. It was generally fun. I I I agree. It wasn't wasn't anything that kind of stood out except for Chew. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I I but in the end, I mean, I there was a few scenes that I thought was really kind of cool and fun, but. Um, I, I do remember one very particularly great scene with Claire, but I, I, I think that's more on the etchy side. So take it for what it is. <laughs> you don't admit that the one thing that stand up to you is etchy. You don't admit <laughs> stuff like that. Well, I did say chew. I mean, the, the kissing was kind of fun, chew-ta, chew-ta. <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's like Andrew said, it's a, it's a show that it didn't do anything that will stand out in the long run. Um, but it was enjoyable for what it was at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think when, when I, and it's unfortunate because like towards the end, it like, for some reason, the show like decided to get really dark. <laughs> like the, the last two episodes, like this is getting like really dark and it doesn't really fit the environment they're kind of putting this stuff into. Um, I will say there was a couple ca- uh, action scenes that I thought were really, uh, were really decent. Um, I especially liked uh, some of the hundred abilities that some car- certain characters had. Emil's hundred was really awesome because it was one of those ones that kind of switched between whatever sh- weapons she wants to have. So she can switch to a bow and she can switch to a a, a fencing weapon or a, a, a blade or whatever. And I really think that when she was in battle, it really stood out to be really awesome. I also kind of liked I... the 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 slayers that were kind of against them at some point. Um, there was at some point they kind of run into these three people that are not within the academy and they're kind of rogues and i thought that they were r- pretty cool as well so i do think that the weapons were kind of interesting but i don't i and it's more on the lines of where can you take that in the ultimate grand scheme and 
I I think well, that they're really early on. They they automatically establish they're at their they're at the max. I mean, there doesn't seem like they can really go in. It's like really early on they get their super sane ability, and it's like okay, well, where you go from here, kind of thing. Right, and and that, but I would I I would say that they're they're more interested in the aspect of like like Karen or like Sakura. Let, let's let's just put it at that. Sakura is doesn't technically have any attack abilities. She yeah, is. I like that. I like that. All and, hundreds and, and are that's, to kill. Exactly, and I I think that was interesting when you go to like Emil and 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 that character's ability to have three different types, um, or Claire, which is a range type, or Hayato, that's a uh, a melee based. And then you go into the Slayers, which had different abilities and their abilities and what they were able to do with it. Where you can take that in you mean the it's ability scheme. that rips off from Fate Stay Night? I didn't want to go there, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like I said, it, 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 and that's what's unfortunate. It's like you have this whole com- combatic aspect of the show, and when you when you just throw it out there and you make them well, pretty much their max already, it's like you, it ends up being only a driving force for the harem. And you have to choose which side. Are you going to put more focus on it being about the harem? Or are you going to put it more focus on it being about the combat? Or are you going to put more focus on it being about this uh, alien race that's coming in? You have to choose what you're going to really suss out. And if you if you spread it too thin, you're not going to spend enough time to really suss out one to be at all interesting. Well, the, the, the biggest frustration I have in it is is I like it because of the idea of you have all these these abilities that you can work with. But if you never kind of deal with that and actually use that, you, you, you focus so much on Hayato just going in and, and, and ending everything. That, that's where you kind of yeah. lose it. And that's, that's more of a frustration to me. I like the element of the virus, too. I thought that was kind of one of those things where, mm-hmm. wow, you can really do a lot with this. They, they messed with it here and there, and it was really interesting. But most of the time, it was like, oh, it's an excuse to kiss somebody. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll go for that. Harem harem win kind of thing. Okay. Harem level up. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking for a, a silly harem show, I mean, it, it's it's got some decent harem elements in there. It's not strong enough for me to say go out there if you like harems. But uh, uh, suggestions... Uh, a couple seasons ago, we had Chivalry Failed Night. I thought that was one of those. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for one that's in a school setting with magical powers, I think Chivalry. I don't. I when I'm thinking about okay suggestions for this show. Okay, it is a magical school, characters in it training to fight something. I can't really think of many that I would actually tell people to go watch. And Chivalry Failed Night was one of those few ones where I was like, yeah, I can suggest that one. Go watch Chivalry Failed Night. It was a, it's a really good show about a guy in a magical school. Uh, Trinity Seven was really decent. I don't, I don't think that they got enough from that show quite yet. I wish they would get another season out of that, but yeah. it was a good in a school setting, harem type setting. I, I think Trinity Seven uh, between Chivalry of the Feld Knight and Trinity Seven. Trinity Seven to me, I, I think both of them knocked it out of the park. Uh, Trinity Seven it just has great protagonist, um, great harem around that protagonist, cool and, mechanics, and cool mechanics and. Yeah, I agree with Andrew. I want to see more of that show. I, 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 I so felt like I was cut off, and I want to see more of that show. I, I went to the manga at some point because of it. Yeah, um, Astro Score um, is currently was currently airing this season, well, which we'll talk about in here in a minute, uh, well, in a couple, in a quite a, in a while towards the end of this episode. Um, but I think that is one that is kind of in the uh, okay territory if you're looking for something like this, so not. I give it, you know, a standing ovation or anything, but it is another one in that realm that I didn't hate. So there you go. You got Day Day Live on here. I, 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 I can in there agree. To see if you would agree with it. I can agree to a point. It's not magical school, but it, it it is definitely a harem, and it does have kind of the supernatural elements, and it does have a protagonist who is kind of working off of effectively Supergirl. So um, take it for what it is. I don't want to say it is exactly a magical girl or magical school, but it is interesting and it does kind of fit in this kind of feel. Mm-hmm. There's other ones like Absolute Duo, which were, it was okay. Um, that's about the only ones I can really suggest. Yeah. If you're looking for magical abilities in a school, then there's, uh, uh, what was that one? When supernatural supernatural battles became commonplace, really good one. Mm-hmm. I like that one. Uh, but moving forward, let's go into something that's completely different, which is uh, Joker game. 
this was one that uh, aired on or was streaming with Crunchyroll. It ran for 12 episodes. And it is a military spy with its genres. And it takes place back in 1937 during the eve of World War II. Um, there is this agency that's w- which is called the D Agency that is basically training uh, spies. And these spies are then sent out to other countries, to different locations, to do what spies do best, which is gain information and whatnot. Um, really interesting about this show is that I can't really go any further than that because really it became something that I was not really expecting the show to become, which, yeah, starting off you meet this guy who is just joining the de-agency and he's this guy that was in the military and he has his own beliefs about what they should be doing and he doesn't like how the spies act and there's this conflict between honor and and being a spy um what you believe should happen if you screw up and what you really should do as a spy if you screw up uh the notion of kill or uh avoid killing because it only makes questions be asked or should you die if you get caught or should you try to fix the situation that kind of stuff comes into play um but what was interesting is it like says goodbye guy like right after like the second episode and i thought i thought the story was really going to fall one person through like some kind of full line through line plot but what actually ends up turning into is okay you have this room full of a bunch of spies you have this de-agency and what the story then becomes is like you pretty much did every episode there was a couple that actually spanned two episodes but they were just kind of stories that of here's a spy at this location and here's a situation he's dealing with and here how this is how he gets the information that he needs to get um the only through line is the fact that a lot of the characters are a lot of the spies that you're dealing with are from the de-agency or it's a, another group that's trying to go against the de-agency and we kind of talked about this beforehand um and i've heard it discussed here and there but one of the both strengths and weaknesses of this show is in the idea that for one you don't have any characters to grasp onto there's I have a bunch of pictures of characters on our outline, and I don't really know much about any of the characters. I don't know what their purpose are. I don't know what their drive is. I don't know their personality because, and that is its strength in the idea that that's what a spy is. These are faceless people, and that's where the strength of the writing is, is that none of these characters, you really grasp who they are, what their personality is, and where they came from because they're spies. They're not supposed to have a personality. They're not supposed to have a history. They're not supposed to have dreams or desires, and that's where the strength comes in is that every episode I had this new face, and I go, I think he's from – yeah, he's from the D-Agency. I remember him from the beginning. Yeah, so he's one of them, and that's where it's kind of really cool is you're following this guy, and he's dealing with this, and you're like, well, I don't know who this guy is. He's dealing with a certain situation where there's a bombing at this building, and at some point it reveals this guy who's been kind of nagging at him every now and then. He takes off his hat and his glasses, and you're going, that's the guy that's from the D-Agency. That's cool. There's this, this spy that's been trying of pointing him in the direction that he should go in order to get the situation sussed out and find out who is behind it. And that's where I think the writing is so clever in the show. I love the writing in the show. Like, every episode, yeah, there's points where it's like, I don't really get why they're doing this particular thing. But then later on, it kind of reveals that everything was kind of put into motion by the spy to get what he wanted to get. Granted, I'd never, I didn't always get the grander picture of what uh, the circumstances that they're in or what repercussions will come from it. But I understood what the spy was doing and understood how the spy fixed the situation. Sometimes it's spelled out for you at the end, sometimes it's not. But in the end, every episode, I was enthralled by the cleverness of the writing. I was enthralled by how uh, clever the spies were. And there was even some situations where you had these other groups against them. And I guess the best way to put it is having these uh, rubbing your face in the ground kind of moments. I loved those moments where it, it, it goes, this is how a spy really works. And they were moments where I was like, Yes, that was epic. I loved how that concluded. I, I love that I'm trying to avoid spoilers, and so this sounds probably very obscure, but those <laughs> are the moments you're doing that I like fine. The most. Those, are, those are the moments that I like the most. I, I love how this show shined in the idea of these are spies. Uh, they're 
they're not they don't really get into them being upset about what they're doing and that might be a fault to somebody and that the fact they don't have personality to be well i don't know if i really should be doing this they don't really care they are spies they do their mission and they kind of do it cold face or some of them actually find uh entertainment in outdoing the other person and that's where it kind of really does have its bread and butter and it's entertaining for me so and it's a period piece too, and that's that's also something you should point out. I mean, it being in 1937, it's not something uh, anime or really Japan in general really wants to talk about is that period of time in uh, the eve of World War II or anything involving World War II. Uh, it doesn't get into trying to suss into what they did or any of that stuff. It was really about the spies and trying to gain information, pull information, and that's where it kind of stuck at. And I don't really fault it for that. I think they did an incredible job with the with the writing in general. So, and now it's yeah. my turn. Okay, yeah, yeah. no Moe characters, so <laughs> keep that in mind before Chris starts talking. There was a couple of really cute characters, though. I don't remember <laughs> the guy that got captured and his and he was he, he had a wife that he felt that he kind of uh, put in danger. I remember cute. the little girl with the dog. <laughs> Just the little girl. He's just like the girl, little girl, not the the lady that was with her. <laughs> anyway, I I I'm, I want to make this very clear. Um, I I think the writing in this show was very well done. I think the 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 show looks very good, and I I can see this show being very entertaining. Unfortunately, I found it very boring. Now that is strictly me, um, and that is because I. I believe I it's because I didn't have any characters to connect with, to enjoy. Um, and, and I don't fault that on the show because like Andrew was saying earlier and I, and me and him both went back and forth. And that I think is the most biggest thing that, um, we both came away from this. This is a show about faceless characters. And I think that that is really what kind of made it very hard for me to enjoy. But, I do not in any way, shape, or form want to give anybody... I think this was very well written. I think it was entertaining for a lot of people, just not me. Yeah. I think that's fair, right? <laughs> I'm not being unfair on this. I I, I do. Th I can see people enjoying this show, and I, I applaud that. Yeah. yeah I, I think that you should probably come into it saying... I think the clever writing, great writing, and then leave it at that. It doesn't really have to point out, not for me, because I wanted characters that I love. I want to hug them all. You didn't think uh, Hatano was cute? Look at that face. He is kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> so shonen. He was like, what's up? Giddy, giddy, giddy. Or was it glitter, glitter? Kirai, kirai? Kirai, kirai. There you go. If he said that, <laughs> you would love this show. Uh, Hatano. I want a picture of Hatano and glitter, glitter. Kirai, kirai? Anyways, um, but yeah, really, 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 really clever writing. Um, I do agree. Like I said, there's, there's points where it does kind of have like, like I mentioned before, I don't really know what the true purpose is, what they're doing right here. And it is kind of slow in that regard, but it's, it's really not a high action show. It's not a, uh, you know, 007 action and crazy drama and one character that you're really kind of connecting to. It's. Again, faceless well, character. Well, there is this this aspect that it is it is very episode. It, it, what Andrew was saying, yeah, at best you may have a two episode little arc, but this is a very episodic show. So you may have one cast of characters, and then the next episode you'll have a totally different cast. So not only do you have this aspect of the faceless characters, you also have this aspect of if you just so happen to find a character that you're interested in. By the next episode, you're probably not going to have those characters, so it doesn't even matter. I I can honestly tell you the point in which I realized the show was really not going to get into fully into character development or following a character throughout a, a string of storylines was the boat story because that story left with such a bitter end, not a Hollywood end, not a happy end, and it left it as that to me realizing the boat or the train. 
the boat, the crew, the big, the, the big cruiser train or a big train, big cruiser boat where it kind of got into the dog and the, 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 the little girl and the, and the, I was going to avoid getting into that stuff. Cause that kind of gets into spoilers, but yeah, um, I didn't know it was spoiler, but the way I'm just, I'm just saying the way that it ended was not rosy. It was not a Hollywood ending and it. The way that it kind of transitioned from that just into another story was like, okay, that was really all that there was. What happened is what happened. And he literally isn't going to, there's there's characters in there that are really not going to see it through to some kind of happy ending. It's like literally we're gonna get to the next dock and that's gonna be it. Like these guys literally have no connection to anybody, and that's what they are. They are spies. That's what's again what's clever, but also at the same time, some people might find that as a weakness. But they are what they are, kind of thing. So it stuck with it. That's that's good. Um. So it shows to suggest, um, if you're looking for a period piece, kind of like uh, Joker Game is, with a more older setting that's more serious, uh, kind of documentary-ish, uh, Showa Gengroku, which was a couple seasons ago, is a really great period piece story that we really loved. Um, if you're looking at something that's more guys in suits, more dark kind of realm area, Bacano is a great example. Another period piece is Young Black Jack. They do a lot of stuff in... Uh, war days and whatnot in the past. Uh, da da is in a setting of a modern setting with you know guys in suits has a similar style to it, uh, a little bit more in the supernatural and crazy style, but definitely a suggestion. Any from you? Mm, not off the top of my head, no. Death Parade again? Yes. <laughs> guys in suit. <laughs> death and Death Parade, definitely. <laughs> oh, um, let's move on to uh, one that Andrews talk a lot about because he continued on into the second season of Terraformers, uh, Terraformers Revenge. I think you're crazy. <laughs> I am crazy. <laughs> I told him, and I think I said it in our pre, our, our first impressions and our I preview. I have heard all about the fact that this one scene is not in here. <laughs> I, I got a spoiler for, when I watched the first season, I really liked one certain group of people, and I loved that story, and I was a little bit tragedy by what happened. And I wanted something from it and i found a spoiler about something and i've been since then i've been waiting for this moment for this one thing to happen and i was hoping that that would that particular point in the manga would be in the second season so i was watching it just for that didn't get it did not get what i wanted but i'll get to what i did get it so we'll get there uh, for those who don't know, Terraformers essentially takes place when mankind has gotten to a point where there's some kind of virus that is spreading, um, or they were trying to get to populate another planet, and so they sent, I think it was moss and cockroaches to Mars to see if it would, you know, create its own atmosphere, and they let it sit there, and over time, they went back to it to see if anything has changed, and what they found was... The cockroaches evolved into, like, human-sized creatures called, that they, they end up calling uh, uh, terraformers. And these terraformers, like, kill everybody on the ship that come to check it out. And there's this disease that's spreading, and mankind wants to send people to, to, the, to Mars to get samples of these uh, terraformers because they believe that the virus is coming from there and they can get a cure. And so starting off with the first season, you kind of had everybody kind of being gathered together. They're chosen because of their abilities or because they're they're apt to have these kind of uh, augmentations happening to their body where they kind of implant genes of uh, insects and animals into their bodies. And then they send them off to Mars to to take out these terraformers and bring back samples. And. It was early on kind of established with the first season. I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll get why I'm getting into this more when I get into the second season. In the first season, it really was established in this element of here's the non-combatants and here are the combatants. Because really quickly in the first season, you realize a lot of people getting slaughtered. And a lot of these people were the non-combatants. There was blood flying everywhere. Heads were being ripped off. It was it, There was a censored version and uncensored version because it was just so outlandishly violent the first season was and it really the first season really didn't have a conclusion because you had all this stuff kind of go down they were on they were on mars they were constantly being sabotaged and it kind of concluded with that and going into the second season you have a very thin amount of ranks whereas before they had so many people they sent they were all basically a lot of them were killed 
And the second season, you're kind of going reestablishing with these groups of people. Um, a lot of the people that were kind of isolated with the first season are finally coming to the forefront with the second season, where you discover that, yeah, one of these groups that was established was kind of going against the rest of the groups. They were, there was a political pulls back on Earth that were trying to get them to sabotage the other groups and take certain people that were a little bit more special. I mean, early on with the first season, you found out that Akari and Michelle were actually children of people that were in one of the previous groups. And so they had two abilities within themselves. So they were more powerful than the rest of them and, or special than the rest of them. So you're finding out that, yeah, government groups are trying to capture these two and bring them back to, to earth to make their country more powerful. So, Sadly, going into this season, the second season, a good chunk of the first part was really about that. Like, oh, yeah, this group is a, is actually betraying the rest of the humans, and at the same time, the terraformers are trying to attack. And I'm like, I don't really care. I don't really care. This is boring. I don't really care. Um, but then what – it kind of does exactly what the first season did to me. It's like I'm watching it, and I'm going, eh, I don't really get this. I don't really care. Eh, decent action. Okay, whatever. And then it does something, and I go, that was cool. Like, I don't know where that came from, but that was cool. And then it kind of goes back to it. I'm going, okay, I'm just watching this to watch it. I don't really care. Okay, that was cool. Right there, that was cool. We're, we're, can we use that writing for the rest of the show? <laughs> so that's really where I come down with this show. Is like it, it, it's like The first season was dumb violence. It was very gory, very violent, decently animated. The second season is, like, way worse animation they toned down the violence because I think that they are running out of people to kill <laughs> because most of the non-combatants are gone. But the special element of the second season was really in the non-combatants that were still left. I think the second season was the season of the underdog, the unspoken heroes really is what I would call it. Like you had so many people that were just like the very low ranks. They were basically non-combatants. Because uh, I think they say at some point um, that the top 10 ranks were the – these were the people that were supposed to fight. And everybody else is really just there to be there. Um, and so most of the low-ranked people – like there's one girl that she's 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 in planning with uh, skunk uh, genes. So her only ability is to just make a stink. I mean that's not very useful you would think. There's a, one girl that has mole claws. And so really all she can do is dig. And so – there's these characters that really have no purpose. They're not strong fighters. They don't have like some characters where they have, you know, the strength of an ant or the 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 durability of an ant. You, you, you know, I'm I'm really kind of curious about these kind of underdog girls, but <laughs> I refuse to go and watch it because I'm sitting here looking at these pictures that Andrew has on this list, and I'm going, oh, that kind of that character's no, cute. it's terraformers no, gonna die. No, <laughs> no, I refuse because the last time when I watched this show, I I went, hey, that character is cute. I like this show, and that I I'm, I'm not gonna say what happened, but that. It, it, no, I refuse to do it. It's ju it's just like the the Schwartz and Markin problem. I refuse to like <laughs> any character in the show. But see, the problem that I had with the first season was really in the fact that everybody was dying, and there was like no way to connect to them. It, it, we, they kept having these flashbacks of, "Oh, here's where I came from, and this is why I'm here." A few of them were really cool. Like I enjoyed uh, Marcos and Alex's story from the first season. I like that they got into Marcos and Alex's story again with the second season because I think it was one of the more stronger stories of the first season. And then they took Alex and Marcus's story and they added uh, Yueko to the story. And I love that. This moment with Alex and Yueko was really precious. And they had this whole moment of self-sacrifice in uh, one of them going into danger and the other one trying to help them, even though they both are useless. Like they're not, they're not, they're not strong people. They can't take on 200 terraformers. And that's really where it kind of out of nowhere just it shines and it has this really cool moment in the show. Um, I enjoyed Alexander's and Syl Sylvester's story. They were the Russians and their story about Alexander trying to get with Sylvester's uh, daughter and how they're from two different countries and and the trying to find common ground through what the world is going through. Those were cool stories. Uh, I liked uh, Joseph Newton. Uh, Joseph Newton finally showed up, and I know that apparently from the manga, that is the exciting one for everybody. He is the number one. He is the ranked number one of Mars, and he was epic. And plus, 
he was voiced by an, a, a particular excellent character from the show again, Roku, uh, Roku Go Shinju. Uh, the voice. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was the the main guy. Uh, what was his name? Uh, the guy that was telling Kiko the story. Kiko or something. Kiko, yeah, I think it's Kiko. Um, he so was an excellent voice, and he 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 rocked. He was awesome. I loved how when he showed up, it threw humor in there that fit, and it worked well. Um, so I had some a little a lot of really great moments, and I loved Hong from uh the Chinese the the group that's trying to go against everybody. I'm Hung, not gonna acknowledge her. Hong was awesome. Like Will they not had, acknowledge her. They had probably the most epic scene in season two was from Hong. They had this whole scene where, uh, not really too much spoiler. Her her ability is she can produce a bacteria, and so she goes out there, and basically you see this rain of, of of terraformers just raining down because she's just killing everything. Not going to do it. And I like the fact Not that she has, <laughs> unlike everybody else who just really has a drive for their purpose or something that has given them a drive mostly to get this cure for this bacteria, this this virus. Hong was that character of like, I don't know why you're here. She shouldn't be here. And there's constantly people kind of going, you need to do this. And it's like, no, she doesn't want to do this because she really shouldn't be here. I love that moment. So, yeah, I mean... That's really where Terraformers comes for me. Both the first season and the second season is really this one where I don't like 75% of it, but then there's other 25% that I really, really like. There's these really precious moments that are kind of sprinkled in there. And again, this this season was really about the underdogs and self-sacrifice and a lot more weight to death because in the second season, it's not people dying left and right. They... It's, it seemed like they were holding their cards really safe in the, the first half. I was like, nobody really is dying, and this doesn't seem like terraformers. I'm expecting people to die left and right. It was a fault because it wasn't like the first season in that regard. It wasn't as violent, but it was a huge pro in the idea that there was more weight to death. Like, it finally came to a point where I'm like, I actually, that sucks, like, you didn't do it. You at the the first season was like I don't care about anybody because they're all gonna die. And the second season was like these are real true moments of self sacrifice and uh, selflessness that was happening that made these deaths actually worth something. So not you know. gonna fall for it. I don't want you to watch it. You don't want to watch it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like I said, it, it had its moments. Like it was it was one of those ones like every other episode I would tweet out like. Hey, something cool happened in Terraformers. <laughs> just, just so everybody knows, like I, I, I watched all these other shows and a lot of cool things happen, but it doesn't mean anything because that shows, you know, like I'm not gonna post every time something cool happens from ReZero. It doesn't make any sense because when I go watch Terraformers and something finally cool happens, it's like I gotta tell somebody something really cool happened in Terraformers for once. <laughs> so, so it has really, really high highs and then just insane long low lows yeah yeah and then a really high high and like hey it's like i said it's like every now and it's like oh cool he did something cool so like, it's it's like compounded because it's coming from this really really low 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 yeah and i'm not gonna say it's like brilliant writing it's just like these really brief <laughs> moments of wow i'm actually attaching to these two characters right here and i didn't think i would ever happen and so and yeah i'd also mention that at the very after cast credit scroll of this season who the hell took control of the animation because it looked like Mikaku City actors like animation. I'm like, did some other studio get the their hands on this little 15 second clip because this looks terrible. Like, the, like the rest of the show wasn't that great visualized, but this was like god awful. <laughs> um, and I also have to point out the fact that it once again has no conclusion. So uh, don't I, I? I wouldn't expect a conclusion to the story anytime soon, but it it continues on with with no conclusion. I mean, it was a it was a chapter end, I would say, but there is no conclusion here, so... And they left more doors open than closed, so... Take it for what you will. Um, Did I have suggestions? Yeah, suggestions. If you're looking for something that's violent and people dying left and right and it doesn't apologize, uh, there's Attack on Titan, which does an excellent job with storytelling and whatnot. Uh, nice Sidonia, which is a phenomenal series. I really love Nice Sidonia, so that's an option. Um... God Eater was another cool series. I like that one as well. And uh, I haven't watched it in a long time, and I've seen it as a suggestion from somebody, Blue Gender. I thought that that one was an excellent series back when I watched it a long time ago. I haven't watched it in a long time, and I actually really do want to watch it again. Um, but that involves... Somebody put it best in the idea that it's kind of like Starship Troopers on Earth, and they're fighting against these these 
alien insect things, and it was a cool series from what I remember. You know, Starship Troopers does go <laughs> with this one. I mean, to a T. <laughs> that first season, yes, very much so. Um, yeah. Starship Troopers, Terraformers. Crossover. Starship Troopers, the anime version. Yeah, That's yeah. what this is. <laughs> Just not as funny. <laughs> Starship Troopers were funny. Yeah, it had some comedic value to it. It was weird in that regard. Um, but they had some funny moments in the second season of Terraformers. Um, that I wasn't expecting. So, yeah. But yeah, Space Space Patrol Ludico. I don't know what this one's about. I think it was about this... At the beginning, it was about a girl that wanted to have a normal life, but she lived in a location that was basically this place where both aliens and humans lived together and she wanted to have a normal life, but she wasn't normal because she was in this location. And her dad was part of this, uh, this, this space patrol group that uh, that was detecting whenever aliens did bad things, and they would go and arrest them. And her dad got screwed up really badly. And over Justice, who's the lead of the space patrol, said, "Ludico, I'll not arrest you or something." He was going to arrest him at first, and then he said, I'll, "You got to join the space patrol, and I'll I'll find a cure for your dad." And then explosions and town stealing and portals and 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 trigger saying look this is all the other stuff that we watched that you should be watching instead of the show was popping up and <laughs> then we went into like uh what was what was the the show that we don't watch because it's too random and too fast um you're 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 no, it's not it's not your yuri um tq TQ. It went into TQ territory where everything's like completely random and just because and explosions and mild noises and and then it concluded at some... I think it, it concluded... It, I think it tried to conclude like five times because it kept saying season finale and then <laughs> at the very end, it, it, I think it said it, this, it, it's to be continued. I think technically we and watched... Then, yeah. I think technically we watched four seasons. Something like that. Yes. The, each, each season was three episodes. Usually you deal with like split cores and Stuff like that. This one was like split within a core. So, yeah. It doesn't really split. But see, Andrew, what you're not understanding is there is the fine art that is involved in Lilico. She no, I'm not. Is... I'm not going to claim. <laughs> I am not. I am not going to be like a lot of people and say this is some treasurous thing because it's done by Trigger. And I'm not. I'm not going to ignore the faults of it because <laughs> it's Trigger and it's artistic and it's showing all these artistic values of. Yeah, there's some really cool action scenes where I can see these people probably slaved over making these cool transitions and action poses and movements. And then like the other 80% of it looked like crap. I'm sorry. The rest of it looked like crap. It was a short. I didn't expect them to put much effort into it, but I'm sorry I, to all the trigger fans. It wasn't my show. <laughs> yeah. I, I liked the little witch wait, academia show episode. I, well, I liked the, the kill kill. I, the kill kill episode. I laughed so hard. I, I, I don't understand. I, had, I haven't even watched all the way through that show, but I did enjoy the whole walking away and the don't lose your way <laughs> music playing in the background. I will admit, I like that. And, with, and, and there's this this aspect of it that that in in one regard, I I, I understand that it, there's probably more humor in the other episodes because they play on the tropes involving that particular show. I... I almost went back and watched the Sex in the City whatever episode or sh show just so that I could understand that that particular episode. But it, then I, I decided I would have to go and do the f the same with Inferno Cop, and I refused to watch that show, and I refused to watch the the Ninja Slayer show. So there's did they do a Ninja Slayer episode? I don't remember. None of them look like Ninja Slayer. They, they, I know they, the Inferno Cock one looks like Inferno Cock. Yeah, I, I got the Inferno Cock. <laughs> well, see, and, and Inferno there's, this, there, there's this thing that some of the humor I, I, I enjoyed. And and I, for the most part, this show, I was entertained. And I do think that those other two episodes, you probably just have to know that show to enjoy the humor in that show. Um, but at the same time, I, one thing that I did point out when we were doing the first impressions is it was entertaining and it was not going into the manic levels and which then... <laughs> it went into the manic levels and, and then... I, those, those episodes, it was like, just forget it. I, I, I re I'm not going to go back and watch this show 10 times so that I can get 10 level layers of jokes. I'm not going to do it. It's 
I maybe I'm just too old. I I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I'm that old. You but youngsters with your fast shows. I I I don't enjoy TQ. I there's a reason why I don't enjoy TQ. It is too manic. That is what this show does. I don't want random chaos in my comedy. So take that for what it is. I enjoyed this show for the most part. The manic episodes, forget it. I I was off. I was absolutely off. And there's really nothing. Started with that Sex and the City one, and then it, yeah. Ever since then, it was like they're all over the place, and I'm like, I, mm-hmm. I can't follow what's going on. I I don't even think they care for you to follow what's going on. <laughs> It's just like people are flying everywhere. They're turning into guns and shooting off and then explosion happens. Black hole flying into it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, and it's one of those, and it's one of those things where I, yeah, I can, I agree with you that I think it's maybe one of those things where, okay, I have not watched that show. So thus I don't get the humor in there, but it's also one of those things when I went and watched, I watched the, uh, little Witch academia, but the little Witch academia show. And I guess technically that was the, the, the most entertaining episode for me, but at the same time, I honestly tell you, I would honestly tell you, in these 13 episodes, I did not laugh once. I didn't even chuckle. I did not get any of the humor. It, it, it wasn't for me, I guess, the thing. The only fact that I watched this entire show was the pure fact that it was a short. It was quick. So that's really all I can give it is if, you, if you're a huge fan of Trigger and you really like their shows, this is made for you and it's not much of an investment. You're going to get what you want to get out of it and move on kind of thing. So... And it did give us the best thing ever at the very end. I, if this show gave me nothing, at the very end, it gave me something. And that was Probably. a well, possible, I, I, possible I, tease. I'm a, well, I'll, I'll give you that. I think that that, that is cool. It, it, it felt like it did a little baton pass to the next possible show from Trigger. But I also like the fact that they kind of implied that Luluco may be a mascot for Trigger. I thought that was really cool. I love Luluco. Apparently, she's in Kisniver, so. Is she? Luluco and Nova's in Kisniver. The, the episode we haven't watched yet. Oh, Somebody okay. showed a picture and they were, they were in a You had me scared for a second. When? <laughs> when did I miss this? <laughs> she's, the, she's, the new, she's the new main character of, uh, of, of Kisniver, so <laughs> watch the next episode. She'll take over. That would be really jarring if they suddenly just like out of nowhere Kiss Diver episode starts and his Luluco is like, I'm taking over now and I have a Kiss Diver thingy on my wrist and <laughs> yay, I'm looking for Nova by hurting myself. Maybe something like that. Um, suggestions. Anything with Trigger, like I mentioned before, if, if I, you like I was any gonna, of this stuff, this Trigger's weirdness. So, As Andrew kind of pointed out and it and I was actually already thinking of this when when they mentioned when we when we got to this section, TQ. If you liked the absolute manic humor that is in the lo- the later half of this show, go watch the TQ. There's yeah, like eight seasons it. of it. They've got like three spinoffs of that show. I mean, they've got you got plenty covered over there. Um, Weird comedy, wanna, though. Huh? Weird comedy. I suggest Hot and Goo. Hot and Goo was yeah. a fun, very funny show. Still got to get that one. Um, anything else? I want to say that there's other shows that we've we've completely been turned off of that. Ha- oh, the um, Strange Plus did that kind of humor. The the very random, very manic. What was the speed. one? What was the one like a year ago with the 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 spaceship landed on their their crops and they were upset and they were doing the they were doing the interviews. oh I might me I might me uh the um. No, it's not my my me because I actually watched. No, this. I my me is a, is is one that I had watched before that. Um, yeah, Magical Summer on Chan. That that was it. Um, that one was. I watched that one, but it was definitely in that same realm of like too much. So yeah, just manic humor and it just it doesn't work for us. <laughs> like her clone suddenly popping out of nowhere because it fell in the grate or something like that. Um, <laughs> our last one. It was the only part that I chuckle. thought was funny. It, it got tickled again. <laughs> it gets tickled just thinking about it. It was so random. I don't know why that worked for me. Anyways, uh, our last one we have is the Asterisk War Season 2, or Gakusen Toshi Asterisk Second Season is the full title for Japan. Um, and this was streaming on Crunchyroll, Funimation, Daisuke, and Hulu, and it ran for 12 episodes. Um, technically, the first season was 12 episodes as well, so this is a total of, of, of 24 episodes. So, 
Um, and for those who have not caught up on the Asterix War, the first season kind of opened up with this idea that there was a catastrophe that happened and it kind of changed the balances of the world. Um, children started being, or people started being breeded with, uh, started being born with this physical ability known as uh, genestelia. And it gave them abilities that were kind of out of the norm. Like right off the bat, you see Ayato and he's just kind of jumping up to this window and he's without, with like, no, with little ease. I mean, he's just, there's special powers about it. And there's, of course, like Jul- Julius was like this girl with that can summon firepower and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they all kind of go to join this uh, Sedo Ukan Academy, and you find out that this academy is one of, I think it was like 12 different academies that were around the world, and they all competed with their best of the best of their students in this thing that was called the Festa. And the big thing that was in the first season was this idea that they everybody has a desire to win this Festa because they can grant your wish, and... Ayato had his own purposes. Uh, Julius had her own wish that she wanted. Everybody had a wish that they wanted granted by winning this festa. And, of course, when we reviewed the first season, the big upset in that whole thing was that, okay, you introduced Ayato, you introduced Julius, they joined together to fight in this festa. Uh, you introduced uh, Saya, who was a childhood friend of uh, Ayato. You introduced, you got a lot into Kiran, who was this quick blade girl, which best girl, by the way who was trying to win the festa for her her father. Uh, and then you also had Haruka, who was Ayato's sister, who had, like, all this mystery behind Ayato and the restraints of his ability and him trying to find her and that she might have fought in this underground festa and all that kind of stuff. But it got into the festa, and then it kind of just cut off, and that was a little upsetting to get into, but it was okay because we knew that this second season was coming, and now it's here, and now we can finally talk about it. Um, so with the second season, it kind of just continues on into the Festa. They're still fighting in the Festa. They're, they're having their competitions. You finally get Andrew's, why didn't I get this in the first season fight of, uh, Saya against the robots. That was like a lingering thing that I wanted to see a conclusion of. Um, but it really just kind of gets, gets to the big climax of the, the Festa and who would win or whatever. Um, at the same time, you still have this dark guy that seems to be, in control of everybody that's bad in the world, and I don't know why. And kidnapping's happening, them trying to save uh, people, and then they got into Julius and her hometown, which we got a little bit into at the first season. And that kind of all wrapped up with, again, the thing that we hate the most of, let's introduce 50 million things and then conclude. So... (laughs) I get another upset. Like I, I'm, I'm worse off now than I was with the end of the first season. In the idea that they introduced 50 million things, 50 million adversaries, all these things, the underground festa, and then they kind of concluded. The positives, though, is that the show is still a, an entertaining show. I still watch it all the way no, through. No, 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 never... no, 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 no. Hey, Andrew, do you uh, want to start you, first? You, you, you missed, you missed the ne- the the note. This show, according to everybody is bad so we have to either accept that this is a bad show or we're going to be or be like we are are where everybody thinks that our opinion sucks because we like (laughs) things too much (laughs) this is nothing new for us (laughs) oh so we're 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 being a hipsters we're hipsters yes yes you just don't know you don't know how cool asterisk war is (laughs) see there's actually like these underlying huge plot lines that you just do not follow. <laughs> Dirk is actually a very clever villain. He's not just he a is. mustache twirler. He's a mustache. He's actually twirler. behind the scenes with all He's these a groups. Golden Zilong mustache. Fong? Twirler. <laughs> Zilong Fawn. Yes, Dirk is is controlling Zilong Fawn. You just don't know it. Haruka, the sister. Yes, Dirk is behind it. He's actually controlling. Actually, Haruka as well. actually, Andrew. You know who's actually pulling the puppet string? Flora, the one with Flora. the voice. Flora, <laughs> the girl with the chicken voice. We never, ex- we never suspected her. Because I never of that suspect voice. her. I never suspect her. Every time she shows you know, up, you it's like, her oh to be gosh. on the screen. <laughs> She's literally. I, I was telling Chris at some point. I'm like, literally every time Flora just suddenly pops into a scene, it shocks me because her voice just comes out of nowhere, like, beep, 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 like, oh my gosh, like. I don't have a problem with voicing, uh, voicing when it's weird or anything ever. It's just for one case, 
Flora just seems like that is a bit too much into the chipmunk territory. And yeah, jarring. Flora, Flora was a little bit jarring. I I will admit that. And not not I mean there there there's this character and then there's the one that's up up there in hundred and. Between those two characters, the, way too. Oh my gosh, uh, Amelia's Amelia's, uh, Amelia's yes. uh, person from back then. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it just yeah. just way too much. And I'm like, and and this one, it's almost like I want to like her because she's got a unique voice, but they, it's just too high. It's just way too high. Too much in the chipmunk theory, like I said. Um, but yeah, I, I think the 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 pros that I give this show is really the well the reason why it, it's cute artwork seems, though. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the show is always seems to be entertaining, and I think it's really in the area of I like Ayato, I like his conflict, I like Julius. I think her conflict is is seems cool. I, even though it was a lot of info dump going into her homeland, I I like that story. It's got an interesting thing that's happening there in her hometown. Um. And I still like Saya and Kieran. I think they are just excellent characters. I want a series with just Saya and Kieran. Like Please. The misadventures of them. Yeah. Like they just go out there they and just, do stuff. They just give up on Ayato and just go off on their own. Yeah, they're, they're, they're excellent characters. I like them. Just make it a Yuri. The problem that <laughs> the only problem I really have in this show is its attempt to make the enemies seem interesting, and they're never interesting. Like, I could care less about RMC and ARD and. Ernest does I, I thing, think, and I think Dirk, our, I and think, Zion Fawn, and Shin Yun, and Shin Han. I, I don't care about anybody they go against. They're never, they never interesting. The first season, yeah, we had the two sisters were kind of interesting. No, RMC and R- ARD were fine. Uh, and, mm. and, and Shin Yun, I, I don't think that they dug into them enough, but... That's the thing. I, not, I, I think that I, if I'm, I'm gonna my my biggest issue with the 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 opposing force per se, because there's just so many things coming after Ayato and and Julius and all of them that it's hard to keep track of who's actually. I, we we think that Dirk is the quote unquote mustache twirler, but because we don't know I what mean, the hell his purpose yeah. is, we don't know why he's doing what he's doing. It's just it's just my, I don't my want issue, them to succeed. My issue is Dirk. Dirk, I think, yeah. is the worst mustache twirler I have ever seen. He's not, and, and we say mustache twirler because somebody kind of pointed this. The the puppet the puppeteer I I call him the the Godfather puppeteer character, and that and, but somebody called it a mustache twirler so well, maybe always, that's the I've new always known as a mustache twirler is basically the bad guy that really has no story to them they're just evil because they're just evil okay I thought it was like puppeteer Dirk is a puppeteer effectively I don't like him because he is never you don't you can't really see his his grand scheme not that you can't. The grand scheme is not necessary per se, but you have to actually show him as an opposing force and you have to kind of give it almost this you have to see the opposing force. Does that make sense? Well, it's just you a, have it's to a, it's know a paper, it's a paper thin uh adversary. It's like okay, suddenly I don't know where uh somebody goes and, and kidnaps a character and then you go and save them and you find out oh yeah, Dark was behind it. Move on. Then you go into this thing, and somebody's in, in danger, and they're they're gonna get killed, and this person is behind it, and you take down that person. You go to fight. Oh yeah, Dark was behind it. I don't care. It's like yeah. I don't care who's who's behind it because it's always Dark, and it never makes any sense. It never is anything but Dark's behind it, and he's over there going, darn, darn it, couldn't do it this time. And then and then he'll turn around, and it'll be that he wanted it all to go this way all, all the all along it to to train up Ayato to turn into the super powerful weapon Probably. that he can use against so and so. It doesn't matter. Dirk is a bad bad, bad guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> a bad bad guy. Not a bad bad guy. So He's a bad, when it comes down guy. to Shin Yun and Shin Hua and R A R D and R M C, none of them are bad. I think they're fine. It's Dirk. No, because just, Dirk was, say, let us say, let us say. Yeah, he was behind. Well, I get. What, I, well, okay, I'll just <laughs> I was shut being up. Fake. I was being fake. I'll shut up now. No, it's just it's just the thing of like I I really don't have any care for who they're going against, and so whenever they have a battle against them, it's always like they're trying to make me care, and it's like I don't really care, and and then afterwards I don't really care, and it really just comes down to I enjoy Ayato's struggle. 
I enjoy is going after. It seems like it's going to take forever for him to ever succeed, whatever he's trying to do. Um, Julius, like I said, I enjoy her story, and I like all these characters around him. It keeps me entertained throughout these two seasons. It's just, again, I don't really have an adversary to really care about. And at the same time, I don't, I don't care about the adversary. And you're opening too many doors before you conclude a season. You have to stop that because... What it does is in the end of the season, it ended up being a bitter taste in my mouth because all I can think about is you just showed me five new characters who were all against them, we, we, and then it stops. We were trying to, to guess it at some point. We were trying to like round up how many different storylines because this this show has the most plot lines I've ever seen going on in a show. I mean... Not even it doesn't seem like Naruto, Naruto, Bleach, n- none of them have the level of plot lines going on and, and that this show does. I mean, every character has at least three plot lines going on at the same time. Ayato has uh, Haruka, um, his things going on with Julius, um, his uh, his personal things with Dirk. You've got Julius, who's got... Um, her her new introduced uh, rival, if you want to call her that, she's got her her background. She's got her kingdom. You got Saya, who's kind of concluded per se, but she's got her things with yeah. Ayato. She's, she's got, got her, her father. Actually she's had got, some kind of conclusion. Yeah, Kieran is the same thing. And, and you could go that through this with pretty much every character, at least the main cast. What's well, the sure. problem is they they touch on it like once and well besides julius and iota they're kind of just still going but the, the other characters you have them touch on their one story once and it's like are you ever going to really conclude this mm-hmm. <laughs> like like i said i was happy that i finally got the battle that i wanted with saya because i didn't get it with the first season but even still then it's like you don't you're not really doing anything else are you you're just gonna go back to let's go on with with julius which is unfortunate because like i said i enjoy julius's hometown that whole thing that's going on there but Julius is like the least interesting character of this entire harem, and yet it seems like you're always focusing on that one character. Ayato should have paired up with Kieran to begin with. That's that's it's easy. By the way, the action they they did a lot with the CG with RMC and ARD, which I did not like. But it seems like the combat sequences are always okay with the show. Like they're 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 pretty basic. But every now and then, whenever Kieran walks into the stage, it's like. Every time Kieran's fighting, it's like they take the entire team, they bring him into the studio, and they say, we are working on this one seed for Kieran. It's like <laughs> it's like they know Kieran's best girl because her swordplay is always phenomenal. Like, they maybe once or twice for brief clips actually used her CG because she was fighting against, like, uh, you know, robots and their CG. But every other time, she's just beautiful animation with her combat, and she's just epic scene towards the later part, too, by the way. Yeah, I enjoy it. Like it, it, it's it's sad because I know that you, like you said, everybody seems to be bashing on it. It seems like it gets a high rating on Miami list, so it seems like there's enough chatter going on. I don't know if it's negative chatter, but it still seems like it's getting a good rating uh, to the fans themselves. So I'm enjoying it. I I hate that they open too many doors and they don't close enough of them, but it's still an entertaining show to, to in the end. It's definitely an entertaining show. I I I enjoy myself watching this show. I. I, I find myself getting insulted a lot because for some strange reason I'm insane for liking the show, but I like it. So <laughs> I still w- I still stand at my moment that I still would have rather had a Chivalry Fell Knight season two, but I'll take what I can get. All right, and that's more Kieran, <laughs> and I can't complain about more Kieran, even though she's not on the screen all- enough. So, <laughs> um, like I said, Chivalry uh, Fell Knight that is one of the suggestions that I have listed. Uh, definitely go check out that one if you're looking for something similar. And this is kind of similar to 100, which Trinity 7 is another one. And I guess, again, Data Live is kind of, you can possibly suggest, like yeah. I said before. Yeah. That's all we have. That's it for this episode. We did we did good. I, I was kind of afraid about halfway through it. I'm like, we're not getting enough stuff in here, but we, we talked enough with each one of them that we... we got well, time. I guess we could go ahead and toss on to this one and, and 100. We could toss on the Tatsuya show. Oh, I got you. Yeah, I, I guess if you want, to. <laughs> I, I I put it as suggest. So is that technically something you're going to suggest to somebody to watch? 
They might have better taste than uh, they might have more refined and better taste than yeah, we do. We don't understand I'll put it that way. We don't understand the power of Totsi. That way, it doesn't sound like I'm insulting them by saying you might enjoy that, and unlike us who are having very fine taste, I'll just say they have refined taste. They'll probably enjoy it more anyway <laughs> because they know what they know how amazing that show is. How amazing Tatsuya is because he's a god, just like us. We 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 know the the underlying through point and deep plot lines that are going on in this show. I also like the the mysterious person that Ayato ran into uh, who helped him find where Flora was. I thought that was a really cool scene. Yes, that, that was. was. I, 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 I that. wanted more of her. <laughs> she was pretty epic. She was pretty epic. Um, again, introducing characters and never touch them again. <laughs> I go right back into that. Thank you. Awesome. Um, but yeah, this is part one of four, possibly four. I mean, if things change, we might knock it down to three, but I think it's still going to stick to four episodes of our reviews for the spring 2016 ep- uh, season. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, again, you can check us out at TakuSpirit.com. It's where you can find all of our news and reviews and all of our other parts. If you're watching this a little later and you can find the other parts there. Again, you can find our forum at the forum link at the top where you can find our community of great people who discuss all these shows on a regular basis every time an episode releases. We have episode per episode or each show broken down in a discussion thread, and you can go in there and talk about a show with them. Uh, there's a lot of chatter that happens each season with people talking about these shows, so definitely jump in there if you want to. Um, you can get any, If you have any comments on each one of these things, you can comment in those threads as well. So if you have your say on Asterisk War, you can go in there, find the Asterisk War thread, and throw your thoughts into it. Uh, we hey, are- and our, our, our community will come in and call us out on our, our stuff. If, we, if, we, if they don't agree with us, they'll come in and they'll call us on it. Not in a negative way. No, no, they're not negative. But they'll call us on it. They'll correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm going to stop from there. Um, our, we're closing with People Password, which was like the only good thing that came out of Space Patrol Luluko. I'm hey, digging myself in a grave. Luluko is cute. Um, and Teddy she Lloyd, is a good thing that came out of that show. People Password was done by Teddy Lloyd, featuring Bomjor Shizuki, which is an excellent song. And I loved it. So give that a listen. I hope they release it on iTunes eventually, but uh, anything else? Luluko is cute, okay, and she came out of it, so that w- the sh- the song is not the only good thing that came out of it. Luluko came out of it. I kind of lost interest in her when she went a little bit crazy towards in there. That's besides the point. We hope you guys enjoyed, and y'all take her. Oh.